Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what else is a great way to build the channel? Tell your friends about it. Spread the word to all of them about the best wine show anywhere. This episode is the fourth of a nine-part series of Uruguayan wine. Uh, these are all free samples, so I have total autonomy in these reviews. Be sure to watch the first episode of this series for a more in-depth feature on Uruguayan wine. The short version is that wine has certainly been made in Uruguay since the early 1600s. However, it's not until 1870 that the modern wine industry really begins in Uruguay. Today's wine comes from Artesana Winery, located in the Canelones department of Uruguay. This is just north of the capital of Montevideo. As far as history, it's limited, Really nothing, I mean like nothing on the website. The press kit I got from the PR firm that supplied the wines for the series at least says something. The winery was developed in 2007 by Blake Heinemann. Of course, I had to do some digging because I like to know backstories and it's what I do. So a quick search of Blake pretty much turned up very little other than I'm pretty sure he's a former executive with Sunoco, which is an oil and gas company. Depending on what part of the country you're in, you're in, you'll see gas stations with their logo. And that's about it. My guess is that through his travels, he got exposed to wines of Uruguay and specifically Tanat, as the press kit, as the press kit quotes him. Uruguay is an extraordinary country. When I first tasted Tanat wines from the Canelones region, I was struck by their richness. Uruguay is being recognized as a fine wine producer and deservedly so. There are excellent wines being made in Uruguay, and Tanat is a very distinctive grape. It has an exotic spicy character that can be big and bold, yet elegant and complex. All right, I, I agree. So you don't have to be born into the wine industry part of this industry. You just have to get bitten by the bug, and it looks like Blake got bitten. So he's the founder of the winery, which is totally fine. I've had a lot of badass wines from people who had the means to start a winery and were never a winemaker or part of a winemaking or wine growing family. We, had, we all had to start somewhere. But people like Blake also know that they need the right team to pull these things off. Enter their chief winemaker, Analia Lazaneo. She was there from the beginning. And the name Artesana is also a reflection of the involvement of women in this winery. Now, I might be saying the obvious, but artesana is the feminine form of artesan in Spanish. Now, besides being impressed about this being a conscious decision from the start, I'm also impressed that they got the URL artesanawinery.com. Now, sometimes URLs that you would think would have been taken are already are still out there. Now, of course, they could have bought the URL from some squatter, but I like the notion it was just out there for the taking. Right, anyway, Analia was born and raised in nearby Montevideo. She studied viticulture at the University of Montevideo and later attended the College of Viniculture in Canelones, where she received her technical enology certification. She also holds a professional sommelier certification from the Facultad de Quimica program in Montevideo. She was integral in choosing the property, what varieties to plant, the clones, rootstocks, block size, etc. So she's an OG with the winery. That kind of rhymes. Anyway, the entire state is 80 acres in the Las Brujas region of Canelones. The 20 acres of vineyards are planted to Tanat, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and the only planting is Zinfidel in Uruguay. They recently planted Chardonnay and Petit uh, Mansang in 2019, so wines with those grapes will be coming into the market soon. Probably in the next two to five years, depending on when they have achieved enough maturity as a vine and then whatever aging they require. Everything is done by hand in the vineyard, not just the harvesting. They farm sustainably with what is called low input. Now that means they add or input the least amount of things like any kind of fertilizers or pesticides as possible. This is a major tenet of sustainability. It doesn't require organic farming or forbid targeted use of pesticides or fertilizers. Just be smart about it. Plus, organic versions of these things exist anyway. So don't get all twitchy if you hear these things. 
With that said, they use what is known as Integrated Pest Management, or an IPM. This is another mainstay of sustainable farming and can even extend into organics and biodynamics, depending on how you implement it. The basic idea is to focus on prevention, be proactive rather than reactive. This can include using other species of plants and animals to prevent pests from taking root, both literally and figuratively. So cover crops can make it extremely difficult for weeds to grow. Having bees or insectary on the property can allow them to be predators to invasive insects. But it's not just this. It can also be things as simple as removing trash or weatherizing a building or not having standing water. It's a combination of things and each winery defines it slightly differently. And yes, it does allow for target pesticide use with the idea that it's a balance between the hazards of exposure and the benefits of control. But keeping in mind that there can be non-chemical options that can provide the same results. And that's what you're looking for is to do that first. The other stuff is like last resort stuff. The vineyard has an average yield of about 2.5 tons per acre, with harvest usually happening in late February and March. They get about 48 inches of annual rainfall, with, which means there is plenty of water for the vines, even though they are planted in well-drained clay soils. Remember though, that clay retains water better than sand, so it's not like the soil has no water. Basically, this is your quote, dry farm vineyards, which is legally required in the EU, by the way. This is not to say that proper irrigation can't make world-class wines either, just that there's literally no need for it here or really anywhere in Uruguay. For this wine, they are blending three varieties, Tanat, Merlot, and Zinfandel. Since they intentionally plant the vineyard in small lots of about 1.5 acres each, that's how the grapes come in. They vinify and age the lots separately and then create their blend. This isn't super uncommon, but it's not something that comes up all the time. The normal way is to bring in everything from a vineyard together, or at least you know, like per, per grape variety, into a large tank or as large a tank as you can get and then ferment it all. Smaller lots allow you to really dial in each parcel. Now let's talk to Nat real quick. So you may have heard that Tanat has a lot of tannins. This is due to its thick skins, but also that it has four seeds versus three that most grapes have. While we always seem to focus on the skins when it comes to tannins, the seeds and even stems contain tannin. In addition to that, Tanat retains acidity very well. So that brings two major things that can help with ageability of a wine. Tannin and acid act as preservatives. Alcohol level can also act to help with aging. And with dessert wines, well, sugar too. Let's get the stats of this wine. The 2020 Artesana Tanat Merlot Zinfandel Reserva. Suggested retail price, $23. From Canelones, it is 55% Tanat, 30% Merlot, 15% Zinfandel. Hand harvested, small lot cool fermentation, maceration about 10 to 14 days. It's aged 14 months in a combination of one to four year old French and American oak. It's unfined, unfiltered. The ABV is 15.4%. This is a big boy, so it's got a third component for aging. The pH is 3.5, TA is 5.9 grams per liter. The RS is 2.3 grams per liter. Production is 365 cases, that's 4,380 bottles. All right, let's get into the wine. I know it sounds like a lot when you say it's 4,000 bottles, but I mean, that's a barrel of wine is, I'm sorry, a barrel of wine is uh, 25 cases. I don't know where I'm getting three cases from, right? No. I'll put a lower third as to a barrel of wine's equivalent, but for, I'm almost positive 300 cases. I don't know where I got the 25 cases from. Anyway, there'll be a lower third to correct me or to confirm what I've said was right. All righty. I have to say this too. So, I've been recording this all stuff all day. It's Monday, the 23rd of January. And so this is the first red wine I've had all day. So I did eight, nine, 10, 11 white wines. I am so ready for some red wine now, especially wines with Tanat. And then a Merlot and Zinfandel, Pff, yeah. So let's get the white paper out. All right, as far as color, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, moderate concentration of color. It's really just red, more of a ruby red. Uh, and it's pretty consistent throughout. 
Um, as far as staining, we've got like moderate stain on the glass. I know at some point, uh, in, I mean, I'm, I'm recording like 20 episodes, so it's not gonna have any time soon this year, but at some point I will have a top down. I just haven't done it. Anyway, so yeah, let's uh, check out everything. So aromatically, definitely aromatic. I'd call it medium plus in the aromatics. So definitely youthful. Lots of really ripe fruit going on here. It really should be with a 15% alcohol. These things should be really ripe. There's a richness, there's a r lots of red and black fruit going on here. That blackberry, that raspberry, that kind of stuff. A little strawberry action going on. Got a little vanilla from the oak barrels. A little bit of clove. There's a, there's a um, you know, just wood quality to it. <clears throat> A little bit of like um, pledge, furniture polish. That so for years I keep forgetting. You know, I want to say wood. I really mean furniture polish. Yeah, there's a little bit of a little bit of tobacco in this, kind of dried, more of the dried nature, not like green tobacco. Earthiness to it. I mean, it's smelling great. All right, let's just get it. Let's just get into this right now. <laughs> yeah. Woo. All right, so a few things to kind of talk about. First, the tannin just hit like instantly. I can also feel the alcohol. So it's a big boy with alcohol and the tannin. But it's really got that really richness and ripeness of the fruit. Like it's like a Luxardo version of the red and black fruits. So yes, maybe a little Luxardo black cherry, raspberry, strawberry, well, not really strawberry, but blackberry for sure. And, and the raspberry, black, black raspberry. I mean, it's just blueberry. It's a cacophony of red, blue, and black fruits. Maybe a little bit of purple in there for good measure. And it's got this kind of, uh, it's as if it's, if it's as if it was all like in this syrup type of thing. So a lot of richness going on here. It's not technically sweet. Uh, and it's not that it's a sweet, it's not that it necessarily that it tastes, tastes sweet but it's a ripeness of the fruit. And there's like a, there is that, that syrupiness to it. The flavor of syrup, I guess, if you want to call it that. You've got that vanilla, you've got that cinnamon, got a little clove in there. It's definitely well-made. It's, everything's really well integrated. Yes, the alcohol is noticeable, but I mean, it's 15 plus percent alcohol. It's, it's probably going to be noticeable. But now that it was the first, after the first sip, it's like more well integrated. So it was just that I hadn't had anything that hot all day, all, all the other wines have been like 13% maybe, and 13 and a half is probably the highest alcohol I had all day. Um, so this kind of hit the palate with like a whew, okay? But now it's not as, not so bad. And now the tannin is a little more tame. Now that my palate's gotten used to the hit of tannin, just in red wine in general, it's not as uh, overwhelming as it was in the very first sip, but it's still noticeable. It is not shy, it's not going away. Like it wouldn't sit there and go, oh, maybe it's like really Pinot Noir. Definitely very tasty. I think it's a really well-made wine. It's 23 bucks, so it's not terribly expensive. The range of wines that we're going through is going to be pretty, I'm going to have some pretty expensive wines here in a little bit. So, but it is a small production wine. It is coming from a country that it's probably relatively inexpensive compared to say other parts of the world to make wine but they are doing some kind of expensive winemaking here. I don't know how much of the oak is new, because um, it just said, oh yeah, one to four year old French and American oak. So yeah, uh, as far as how much is one year old versus four year old oak, I don't know. But my guess is that they may have some higher end wines that have new oak and that these are reused barrels, which is totally fine because that's what wineries do all the time. Um, it tastes really good. They're doing some really good stuff on here. So, I mean, you know, kudos to these guys, uh, or gals actually, to, uh, to really do a really great job. Yeah, absolutely. Super delicious. And Elliot, you did a great job, which I'm, I mean, I wasn't doubting anything, but yeah, I think you did really, really good in uh, creating a very, very good, excellent, if not, I mean, actually excellent wine. And I like the combination of grapes that you got here. Um, now, with that said, you got Zinfandel in here, and Zinfandel is kind of notorious for having like grapes that are fully ripe and maybe not fully ripe. And I kind of get a little bit of that 
Um, it was right near the very end. I was kind of like, oh, I feel like I get a little bit of like underripe fruit in here. And so that could be going on with the Zinfandel. It doesn't necessarily mean it is, but that is something that is a characteristic of Zinfandel. All right, well, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time.